Where is your Oscar? Is it in the room there? Uh, would you like to see it? Yes. I should have asked okay. that. Hold on. It's it's um, it's a, it's an amazing thing actually to sort of have this, having watched that show uh, since we were children. Uh, so it you know it, it comes with uh, with all kinds of memories and all kinds of uh, of stuff with it. What you actually just saw was the tag end of uh, quite an interesting interview with Oscar-winning director, producer, cameraman Frank Stifel. This is bonus episode number eight of Westock Online, sponsored by Pond5 and LumaForge. Hope you enjoy. Thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. This is Chuck Braverman, your host and moderator for this special edition of Westock Online. Uh, today we have a very special guest. He is a brand new Oscar winner. And his name is Frank Stifel, and he is the producer and the director and the cameraman on a documentary film called Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405. And let me just, let's go right now to Frank, who is speaking from his home office. How are you doing, Frank? I'm good. How are you, Chuck? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, just uh, as a as a note right off the bat, I will uh, let you all know that Frank and I actually are very good friends for some time. We we met biking together around Santa Monica, and although we haven't been biking in a while, we're still we're still That's friends. True. And I'm quite happy and quite proud of my friend, and I think he's well deserving of this honor. And I think the, one of the, beside the fact that, uh, that Frank and I are friends, uh, I wanted to feature this film and Frank because after he won, I really sat down and thought about what you have accomplished, Frank. And, and I thought it was pretty extraordinary because not only were the other uh, hundred films that were submitted and the four Oscar nominees, you know, quite good films, especially the other nominees. But you were up against some rather big time competition in terms of promotion and newspaper ads and screenings and handouts and everything else. And you want to just enlighten us a little bit on on what your feelings were after the nomination and going forward, and especially as it involves uh, a promotion of your film and and how it got made. Um, okay, well, I, 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 there are so many tracks to be able to speak about this. Um, so one of them it has to do with the fact that uh, that in the shorts category, um, it's you know it's a category that uh, for the most part, and up until recently, probably um, an awful lot of people like me entered. Uh, which is to say, people who had a, a great deal of passion for a subject um, and had no support um, while making the film. What what's happened over the over the last few years has been that some very big players are into the are into the uh, the doc short category, um, beginning with the New York Times and their op docs, going to Netflix, HBO, and a series of other smaller but still formidable entities. And so um, so if you're not part of that game, if your f film hasn't been picked up by Netflix, you now find yourself coming up against um, uh, opening up your New York Times in the morning or your LA Times or your San Francisco Examiner or whatever it is, and, um, and seeing full page ads for the New York Times, Netflix, HBO as, as those films um, uh, are, are promoted. Um, and so, uh, uh, there's a moment where you just put up your hands and go, I, you know, we, th there's not a chance. Um, and, um, uh, but you know, you, you know, as, as was pointed out to me when, you know, early in the game, 
when when the only judges were were the uh, uh, the documentary branch, it was pointed out to me that this is a very cranky group of people, and they are not likely to be bought by an ad. Um, that was true in every case. Um, uh, of the shortlisted films, the ten shortlisted films, uh, three were New York Times films, three were Netflix films. So that's six out of ten. Of those six films, only one survived, Heroin, with a knee at the end. Um, uh, it was a Netflix film, and that was the, uh, the only of those films that um, that's survived the cut. Uh, all of the New York Times films uh, went away. Uh, two out of the three Netflix films went, went away. Later, uh, Traffic Stop was picked up by HBO. And so the final, in, the, in the final analysis, we had one HBO film, one Netflix film, uh, and three unaffiliated films. Well, so uh, we had conversations about what should be done after the nominations and what exactly, what did you do and what, what did the competition do in your, your opinion? Well, I, I, th I think that, you know, that um, Netflix, you know, Netflix has a, a, a large promotion department uh, and certainly enough ad and, and a lot of advertising dollars. Um, uh, and so, and they were put against promoting their film uh, HBO began promoting uh, their film. Uh, uh, voting began on the 20th of, uh, uh, of February. February. So voting for the Academy Award began uh, on the 20th and ended on the 27th. Uh, HBO uh, streamed their film starting on the 16th and introduced it with a lot of fanfare and advertising uh, on the 19th, the day before voting began. Um, so, uh, so th again, that's, you know, that's formidable. Um, uh, it, it occurred to me that the, that the two or three things that I had going for me were a, a berserk title, uh, heaven is a traffic jam on the 405. It's, it's interesting. The other day, uh, somebody published an article in one of the trades on the 10 things that we did wrong and still got the Academy Award. One of them was you're supposed to have a short, punchy title, which we didn't have. Um, but it occurred to me that there was a certain power in that, in that uh, it, it made you curious. Um, and so one of the things that I did a lot, you know, many months ago was I had um, uh, 150 lawn signs made, which were sent, uh, which I put in various parts of the, the city uh, near the 10, the 101, and the 405 freeway without a dot .com, a 20 by 18 lawn, lawn sign, the kind that uh, the guy who's running for Congress might put up. And uh, there was no call to action. It was just this curiosity. What do they mean by heaven is a traffic jam on the 405? And we did that in two flights, um, one at the very beginning of this and one toward the end. Um, and I and and it was purely to be uh, to be curious. It was cu um, and as you were driving by, if you saw if you if you were driving by at forty miles an hour, you picked it up. Uh, I'm not sure anybody thought about it very much, but um, but what happened now was the title started to become familiar. Um, and I remember being at a doctor's appointment some months ago. He examined me. He said, uh, "You're fine." Uh, what have you been doing? I told him I was trying to get some attention for this film. He asked me the name of it. I told him, and he said, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know that film. I said, really? <laughs> what is it that you know? And he said, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, people are talking about it. I said, people are talking about it. People are talking about my, my short documentary. And what are they saying? He said, well, you know, you know, the film's got some buzz. And I thought, only in L.A. can your doctor say your film has buzz. The fact is, uh, he didn't know a thing about the film, but I then asked him what his commute was. And he told me how, he told me the road that he took, and I told him where the sign was. And, uh, and he just closed his eyes and he said, yes, I pass that every single day. That's exactly what I wanted. I just wanted familiarity. Um, 
And the other thing that occurred to me was that while I don't, by nature, have a great deal of confidence in, in institutions, um, I do and did have a great deal of confidence in the film. And I felt that if people saw it, and if uh, that it would, you know, that, that um, and so I made it available on the internet for free to anyone. Um, uh, at last count, I think it's 190,000 downloads. And what happened over, over time was um, people did begin to embrace it. Whether they were Academy members or not, I, I didn't know. But I felt that if it were embraced, eventually this would get um, to, to the community I, I wanted to attract. And sure enough, um, on, on a given day, there was one celebrity and then another that, whose, whose Twitter account indicated they had seen this film that they loved. And, um, and now that went out to, uh, to a group that I couldn't get next to. I, couldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to, but it had the imprimatur of somebody that they knew that had loved the film and maybe that caused them to see it. And again, I made it very, I, I made, there, there was no wall between anybody's desire to see the film and their ability to see the film. So I think all of that probably helped the film. Can you guesstimate? Uh, obviously no one will know ever, but do you think you picked up what number of votes from Academy members from your sign place? No idea. No idea. Um, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, they, uh, there's a great line. It's very, very old uh, by Lord Lever, one of the Lever brothers, um, who once said, I know I'm wasting 50% of my advertising dollars. I just don't know which 50%. And I think it's that. I think that, um, you know, you either believe that, you know, that ideas and stunts like that are good, um, but it's impossible to quantify them. Um, but, you know, in the same way that you, you know, you believe in your film, um, if, you know, you've got to, you've got to go the whole distance on, you know, on something like that. So I, I vaguely think it had some impact, but there's no way for me to know. So, like most of the other films that were nominated, you had uh, three or four sizable six-figure grants that were backing you all the way with just boodles of cash. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, um, I, I my, mean, that, my, my that, film was made. My film was made for about four dollars. Um, aside I, I, from doing, yeah, go ahead. No, I just wanted to. To say it's extraordinary that I I happen to know you know that that you that you didn't have uh, HBO or Showtime or Netflix or Amazon or the Ford Foundation or ITVS or anybody behind you and and I just want to hear about the process and uh, and about writing checks and maybe if you say it was so little it, it doesn't matter that much but uh, what was that like going forward and I you know I know it took several in a long time to make this film. So this is uh, this is a second career. I was an executive producer and uh, uh, primarily made TV commercials, did some television, um, and made my first film at the age of sixty-three. Uh, that film was about my mother, and you know I didn't have a plan. There was no, the, the, you know, my 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 big plan was to to make a film about my mother that I would give to my children, and they would have a record of who this remarkable person was. Um, she was alive at the time uh, and healthy, and so I felt I needed to make it at a given point. I was, uh, uh, I was an executive producer at Radical Media who had purchased my company years before. And, um, and so I took some time off, made the film, um, spent far too long cutting it because you know when you're you know when when you're the guy that's asking favors you're at the end of the line uh and uh and that film had this you know this magical uh entry into the world it, it was shown at, at, at the berlin film festival it was probably in about 30 international fe festivals it was at the museum of modern art um picked up by hbo 
Um, and so that caused me to think, well, this is a much more fun thing to do than sitting in an office, and I quit. Um, uh, um, Heaven is a Traffic Jam is, is my second 40-minute film. Um, and, and one of the things that I vowed when I, when I retired from, you know, from, from actually you know, drawing a salary um, was that uh, I was not going to wait. Uh, all of us that do anything, whether it's television or films or docs or commercials, you spend an inordinate amount of your time waiting for somebody to give you permission. And, um, and at the age of 63, I, I wasn't willing to wait. And so uh, I felt that what I needed to do was figure out the cheapest way possible for me to make these films. And um, so aside from all the credits that, uh, that, that you mentioned before, I was also the messenger. And, um, you know, and, and the gaffer, I mean, anything, I would venture to say that 90% of heaven was done with me alone. Um, I, uh, if I was interviewing, I would, I would hire uh, Ben Marius, who's a friend of both of ours, um, just so that he could sort of deal with the technology while I was with, with the, uh, the subject that I was interviewing. Um, and I shot two cameras, and he was, he was responsible for that and sound quality. Um, and uh, I did a, a number of uh, reenactments uh, most of which did not make the cut. Uh, the thing I, I, I say about uh, Heaven is if it took time <coughs> or money, it's, it, if, if it took time or money, it's probably not in the cut. Um, and, and that's just, you know, that's just the way it wor worked. Um, there were some things in it that were expensive that I felt ex relatively expensive that cost a few thousand dollars um, when uh, that seemed to make sense at the time. And then when putting together the final film, they didn't. Um, uh, there w was a shot that I was terribly proud of that, uh, uh, that I thought was beautifully directed. If I did so say, say so myself, it just didn't belong in this film. Um, and so, um, so at the end of the day, despite you know, my, my happiness over what, what the shot was and, and the expense in putting it together, um, it just, you know, it, it just took down the totality of the film, and so it had to go. Um, that's yeah, one of the, I mean, it, you know, I, was gonna say you know, that's one I, of I the, just did. Go ahead. I was, that's one of the faults of young and upcoming filmmakers like yourself <laughs> that, that find it difficult to take out their, their favorite shots, and they, you know, you say no, it's our, true. our babies, I, right? Um, the, 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 the editor knew immediately, and, um, and I kept on saying, well, you know, let's, let's try it again. And... Um, uh, and at the end of the day, it just didn't fit. It, you know, it might fit into you know one of your films, but it didn't fit into this film. Um, and so, um, so it had to go. And uh, um, so, but I, like I said, ninety percent of it was was my, me, uh, camera, sound equipment. Um, that's it. What was it like working with Mindy, who was the the star and featured in your film? Give me a short description, and then we'll run a clip afterwards. So, um, Mindy, Mindy is um, a, a a woman who is an extraordinary artist. Uh, suffers from you know a number of mental disorders, um, and is one of the funniest, smartest people I've ever met. And so, one of the great joys is was just hanging out with her, um, and um, and. You know, and we continue to do that. My wife or I speak to her every day, um, and that's not work. That's that's pure pleasure. Um, so uh, that was that was just this uh, this this gift that um, uh, I, I I wouldn't have expected, but you know, remains this uh, this this wonderful thing that sort of dropped into my lap. So here is just a short, uh, here's a minute or so, a little bit of background uh, in the, towards the beginning of the film. Let's take a look. When I was one six, sick as teen, everything for me started getting worse. My father and I were fighting all the time. It seemed to me that 
whenever he saw me, he would start to yell. I just infuriated him. He saw her being helpless, not being able to care for herself. And I think he thought that that, that was deliberate, was something that she could, she could help, that she could do something about. My mother didn't uh, step in between us. Possible she was afraid of him. Possible she did not have those natural mother feeling of protecting your children. And at one point it just became so bad uh, between us. My mother came to me and said, I think you should leave. So I, I did. I did. What was it like showing the film to Mindy the first time? And at what stage of the film did you did you show it to her? Um, so I was, I was always aware that I was dealing in dangerous territory here. I was dealing with um, uh, a family, uh, a mother who uh, had a great deal of shame about her behavior, uh, a father who um, uh, was abusive, and yet his wife uh, was vested in protecting his memory. Uh, not to mention, you know, Mindy herself, who... Uh, um, who had been at the effect of, of this family and who had, you know, endured horrible um, uh, uh, things having to do with her disorder. She had um, electroshock therapy. She uh, s uh, had a 10-year period without uh, her inability to speak. And so I knew I was, I was, I was uh, treading... Uh, lightly i had to tread lightly over this stuff and i didn't want to, i certainly didn't want to make things worse for anybody um and so i i determined that uh, i needed a governor i needed somebody to tell me that i had taken a shortcut and uh and and i had put together footage that uh if if i had put together footage in such a way that it was not entirely true i needed to know that and I decided that Mindy was that person um, and that I would show her every cut. And, um, and the first time I, I showed it to her, you know, the film went from, you know, a first cut of, of 84 minutes where uh, I was pretty cl clear that I was lost and to 62 minutes where it, it started to take shape to 40 minutes, which was it's, it's you know, where it should have lived. After every cut, I showed it to Mindy and, and gave her uh, a pad and pen and said, write down everything that seems wrong to you. See, anything that seems that I've, t I've cut a corner. And, uh, and the, fr the first time that uh, we did this, um, she sat there quietly and, uh, and at one point started to scribble something on the pad, which I couldn't, I couldn't find. And... Um, and at the end of it, I looked at the pad, and what it said was, too much Mindy. Um, so uh, we did that over and over again. Every time I had a cut, I invited her over to take a look at it. So Mindy uh, took all these notes. Was there any point in time where, did you, did you take all of her suggestions or none of her suggestions, or what was the, what was the process there? Um, there was nothing that she felt that was objectionable. Um, the uh, so uh, in it, so when I when she wrote too much, Mindy was actually just a joke, um, you know. But but you know, but I think it, it does deal with the issue of 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 what it's like for anybody, you know, anybody who's not used to being on camera to suddenly be looking at their story, to be looking at themselves for forty minutes. Uh, that must be something. It certainly. Uh, it, you know, it was upsetting to my mother the first time uh, she saw a film. I'm sure it was upsetting to Mindy. There was nothing in the film that uh, that she felt was unfair. So we never did. We never did actually have to do that. Um, 
I found uh, in looking at, at cuts that there was one piece of it that, um, that I would always twitch. Every time there was a particular line about uh, that Mindy's mother used to describe her husband, where she described him as being powerful. And uh, and that was part of the uh, you know the the let's make you know let's retain uh, you know pleasant memories of the deceased. Um, he wasn't powerful, and every time he wasn't powerful, he was an abuser, and um, and so every time that line came up in the edit, I, I just could feel that twitch, and in fact went back up, um, for another interview just to deal with that issue. And, and, sh and, and to, to Mindy's mom, to Barbara's uh, credit, um, she allowed me to go there um, and she was able to speak about um, his intolerance toward her, toward the rest of the family. So your film is very intimate and it reveals quite a bit. Let's take a look at another inside short clip from the film. I'm... Uh, uh... It's really not nearly as bad as times as I've had before. And uh, where I've ended up in the hot pistol and suicidal times ago. I was two, seven old, and that's when I completely fell apart and had no speech at all, not any ability to write or think words. I just started to lose control of my body. I had had a nervous breakdown and I was hospitalized in a mental hospital. The doctor there said, don't worry, we will find the rock in your head. So I was terrified because I thought that there was some gigantic tumor going on in my brain. It's pretty heavy stuff, actually, I mean, but we have the best to come yet at the end. You know, the thing, you know, I looked at that and it, it occurred to me that uh, we think in terms of interview as being the interview. Um, in, in Mindy's case, there were six interviews. Um, and just, you know, the dynamic of our relationship was such where, um, uh, you know, so much of her story had been hidden, so much of it uh, there was so much shame attached to so much of it that, um, you know, it just had to happen over time and it couldn't all happen at one time. Um, I, um, I probably prepared two or three hours for every interview and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and I just found that, you know, we, we could go for about three or four hours and that was it. Um, and like I said, we, we had the benefit of enjoying each other. And so we would hang out when, you know, when I didn't have a camera in my hand and, and, and over time, you know, there were layer upon layer upon layer that just got pulled back. And so those interviews became more intimate, um, as, uh, as I think we trusted each other more. So, um, so that's, you know, probably six interviews of, I probably have 20 hours of interview for a 40 minute film. Um, and, um, and it was just necessary to do it that way in order to get as close to her as, and, and, and to understand that, you know, the, the various levels of that story. What we really haven't talked about yet is one of the more extraordinary parts of the film and, and her story is her art. And, um, you know, we've seen some of the paintings and the clips here, if you, if you haven't seen the film. But I think the most dramatic example of her art is the paper mache uh, material that she does. I'm, let's run this other short clip here and take, take a brief look at uh, 
a little bit of what she's doing. I was trying to think, who could I spend that much time focusing on and really want to be with their face? And it was obviously my doctor, Shoshana. It was a really difficult project because it was very hard for me to see her really because my feelings are so big. Before Shoshana, I was a complete mess. I was terrified of everyone. I hated myself. I blamed everyone for being rotten to me. No matter what craziness was happening around me or in me, there was this one person always on my side, Shoshana. So I know the, as of the day or the week of the Academy Awards, uh, you didn't have any distribution for the film. And I'm wondering, since you've won the award, has that changed? It hasn't. Um, it hasn't. I, I find it surprising as well. Um, you know, I think that the, uh, you know, I think that your film is, you know, as, as good as your film may be, it has to fit into, you know, into the world, into the, the world that, you know, that you're now living in. Um, and so uh, people are, are not buying your film as much as they're buying an audience. Um, and, uh, and so just in watching what, what has been picked up, um, they tend to be edgier, they tend to be very hard edge, they tend to be about today's headline. <clears throat> uh, this is not, this is not an easy film to describe in one sentence. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very nuanced portrait of somebody who, uh, who suffers from mental illness. And while what I have found in traveling around the country with it <clears throat> is that mental illness is in everyone's family, it is not a subject that anybody really wants to speak about. Um, so the film, you know, I, I, I still have hopes that it will be picked up. Uh, and I am surprised that I haven't received a phone call yet. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it, it doesn't fit uh, crisply into what is wanted right now. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know this, is, this is a period where uh, true crime documentary has done really well um, and issues of, uh, of addiction and issues of uh, uh, brutality. Um, so this is none of those. So since this is only your second film, uh, I guess you're just gearing up and getting ready to do the next one. And, and now that you, you have this little boost behind you, what are you, what are you going to be doing? It's going to be similar. I mean, it's going to be similar in, in, in approach in that uh, I'm not going to be looking for funding. I'm not going to be looking for, uh, for anybody's opinion. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, fall in love with somebody and I'm going to just, you know, dive as deeply into their lives as I possibly can. Um, there's a subject that I've been interested in. I have a meeting on, on that next week, um, uh, to see whether, you know, somebody can help me sort of flush out that subject. Uh, there's a kid that I met at a party who, um, you know, who suffers from, uh, from something and is just so open hearted uh, and so generous in just in, in a 15 minute conversation we had that I want to know more about him. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I, I think that it'll probably be similar. I think that if I go the route of, uh, you know, of, of, of a portrait, which I've done twice before, I think it's just a matter of, of finding somebody who I'm just so curious about, uh, who, somebody who, you know, who so doesn't live my life and I just want to know more and more about theirs. 
Um, and, and the motivator and the, and the propulsion of the film really becomes my need to know more. Um, uh, or it'll be this, this other thing that, uh, that I've been curious about for many years. So, it, you know, but yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on the make, man. I'm, I'm looking for something. It's going to be similar. I mean, it's going to be similar in, in, in approach in that uh, I'm not going to be looking for funding. I'm not going to be looking for, uh, for anybody's opinion. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, fall in love with somebody. And I'm going to just, you know, dive as deeply into their lives as I possibly can. Um, there's a subject that I've been interested in. I have a meeting on, on that next week. Um, uh, to see whether you know somebody can help me sort of flush out that subject. Uh, there's a kid that I met at a party, who um, you know who suffers from uh, from something and is just so open-hearted uh, and so generous. In just in in a 15-minute conversation we had, that I want to know more about him. Um, so I, I think that you know I, I think that it'll probably be similar. I think that if I go the route of, uh, you know, of, of, of a portrait, which I've done twice before, I think it's just a matter of, of finding somebody who I'm just so curious about, uh, who, somebody who, you know, who so doesn't live my life and I just want to know more and more about theirs. Um, and, and the motivator and the, and the propulsion of the film really becomes my need to know more. Um, uh, or it'll be this this other thing that uh, that I've been curious about for many years. So it, you know, but yeah, I you know I'm I'm uh, I'm on the make, man. I'm I'm looking for something. Well, thank you, Frank Stifel, Oscar Award winning documentary filmmaker. It's been a pleasure interviewing you, being your friend, and I hope we obviously continue that. Hope maybe even take a bike ride sometime in the future thank you so it'll much. have to be short it'll have to be going downhill only <laughs> that's our favorite part <laughs> isn't it <laughs> yeah it really is all right thanks thank you, again Chuck. thank you take care okay. goodbye